So I want to end with talking about evaluation as an important subsystem of your medical education program. And, and this is really now gets into what type of assessments and how those assessments need to run. So again, I love this quote. As you think about your evaluation system, I would have you keep Paul Batalda in the back of your mind. Every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results it generates. So if your evaluation system is not giving you the kind of information and helping you make good decisions, think about how that evaluation system is designed and why it's not giving you what you really need. So this is just some evaluation basics, right? So the communication of goals to the trainees is very important. And as we've just heard, there's some early evidence that suggests that milestones provide a more detailed, explicit way to communicate the goals of the training program and provides a roadmap for trainees. Once we know what those goals are and what that roadmap is, we can then perform the assessment and evaluation processes. Now sometimes people break up assessment and evaluation. Assessment often refers to the activities that help you make a judgment. That's what evaluation means. Evaluation is assessment plus judgment, and that's evaluation. And once we've done that, we can give feedback to the individual to help them get better. And obviously the assessment and evaluation processes and the feedback all need to be looped back or fed back to inform and revise the goals. And hopefully this all occurs within a supportive educational climate. So I like to think of the evaluation system as an evaluation microsystem. And this is a group of people who work together on a regular basis to perform evaluation and provide feedback to a population of trainees over a defined period of time. This system has a structure that carry out evaluation processes that produce an outcome. And in our case, those outcomes should be competent trainees and high quality patient care. The evaluation microsystem has to share educational goals and outcomes. Again, those shared mental models and understanding. They have to link assessment evaluation processes across rotations to the composite committee and feed those back to the trainee. They have to share information about the trainee performance, not only to the trainee, but frankly to faculty, making sure that everybody understands what the needs of the trainee are as they move through the system. And the group also shares the desire to produce a trainee truly competent at a minimum, think back to the Dreyfus model, to enter practice or fellowship at the end of training. The system has to involve the trainees in the evaluation structure and processes. One of the biggest mistakes programs make is they exclude trainees from helping the program to design an effective evaluation system. Trainees are very smart and can be very helpful in designing structure and processes that are most effective. More importantly, it allows them to have input into what's happening to them and therefore enhances buy-in of the evaluation process. The system has to provide both formative and summative evaluation to trainees. At some point, we do have to make a judgment as to whether the trainee can move forward. But as we highlighted earlier, the most important piece is that formative assessment that's needed to help them with constant professional development and to make sure, again, they're on that right trajectory. The system must also be embedded within, not outside, the overall educational system. In other words, assessment is not an add-on. Assessment is critical to learning. Remember the adage, assessment drives learning, and that's very important. Assessment provides the feedback that helps people design their educational activities and helps them fill the gaps in order to become most competent. And then finally, the summative evaluation is a responsibility for the profession to the public. As Lou Pangaro likes to say, effective evaluation equals educational professionalism. And I believe that. I think it's very important that we look at assessment and evaluation as our social responsibility to both trainees and the public to make sure that our trainees are acquiring the competencies they truly need. So what are some of the system components? Well, just like any system, you need effective leadership, right? The program directors, the clerkship directors, and faculty have to be, be leaders in making sure the assessment occurs and is done well. We talked about the need to clearly communicate goals, both to the trainees and the faculty. Too often, we forget the faculty in the communication of goals. And this is where milestones and the entrustable professional activities can be very helpful 
and making sure there's a shared understanding between trainees and faculty about what those goals actually are. Evaluation of the competency is multifaceted. No single tool will be sufficient to be able to say that a trainee is truly competent across all six competencies. And then finally, transparency is important. You have to involve the trainees. Self-assessment reflection by the trainees is a vital part of the process. Remember what I said earlier, that trainees must be very active in a competency-based system. They have to be active participants, not passive recipients of the assessment information. And trainees must have as much access to their file as possible. Remember, ultimately, that assessment is as much for them as it's for anything else. And if they don't have access to it, it's hard for them to know where their challenges and deficiencies are. And so giving them as much access as possible is highly recommended. In this new era of competency-based medical education, competency committees are likely to be a must. You need the wisdom and perspective of the group to make good judgments. You may be familiar with a wonderful book called The Wisdom of Crowds. Well, that applies here in making judgments about somebody's competence, particularly when those judgments are summative. In other words, do they graduate or not? Do they advance from one year to the next? In competency committees, using the framework of the competencies, milestones, and EPAs is essential to making good decisions. You also need to have continuous quality improvement as part of the evaluation program. That data has to be fed back in the quality improvement cycle so that the program and institution can continue to improve the evaluation program and system. And finally, as I said before, you got to have a supportive institutional culture. An unsupportive institutional culture that does not support, for example, a faculty member giving a particularly difficult or low rating um, can really undermine the overall evaluation culture. And so it's important that the institution understand that sometimes faculty have to make tough decisions. And when they do, that should be supported because it takes courage to do that. And institutions that don't do that run the risk of having trainees with difficulties get passed through the system, graduating from that program, and then causing harm once they enter unsupervised practice. I can tell you, as somebody who sits on the Credentials Committee at the American Board of Internal Medicine, I see far too many of those individuals come across our system because they've gotten in trouble with the State Medical Board. And when you look back at their training history, it is clear that they've had trouble in the past and nobody intervened. We really want to avoid that. So institutions have to step up and support program directors, com competency committees when they're making a tough decision.